Tonight, before we get started, we have a bunch of usual requests. First, please silence your cell phones uh, before the speaker gets up. You have a couple of minutes for that to happen. Um, please do not eat snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. Uh, if this means something like grabbing a cup and pouring your, your uh, food into it, that would be much appreciated. It's amazingly disruptive if you have a crinkly packet going on next to you or for the speaker or for everyone else. Um, and lastly, uh, we have microphones set up here for questions. Um, if we can hold questions until the end, is that good? I should have clarified all this earlier, but I was running about. Yeah, if we can hold questions until the end and then have people line up, we'll, we will alternate questions between the microphones. This will make it uh, easier for everyone to hear your question so they'll understand the answer. It will also mean that anyone on the streaming end of this or anyone who listens to the recording later will understand both the question and the answer. That is um, very important. Um, our next meeting uh, will be February 9th on OwnCloud. That will be coming up in Meetup. That is, uh, and you can, um, the RSVPs will open a couple of weeks before the event. And after that, in March, we will have a kernel talk on virtual memory management and virtualization, again, in the Linux kernel. Um, so that's to give you an idea of what's coming up. Those will be posted to the Meetup page uh, shortly. Um, Again, I'd like to thank our regular space sponsor, Bloomberg, and acknowledge our other sponsors, past and present. Those include IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media uh, for all of their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers. Uh, raise your hands if you feel like it, if you're here, but um, I can't see anything with these lights in my eyes to point anyone out, I'm sorry. Um, the announcement section. We have the regular Nylog workshops. If uh, you are interested, please contact or grab, uh, I see David over here or Rob. Uh, the next one I did not see posted, but should be coming up very soon. Again, sorry for all these beginning of the year sort of wrinkles, but uh, we have a workshop that ha takes place at City College at 138th in Amsterdam where people can sit down and sort of uh, work away at the things that interest them. Um, that will, again, pop up at our Meetup page. Um, Do we have any of the Linux distro CDs, or is that not happening today? Wonderful. So there are Linux distro C uh, CDs or DVDs. Probably CDs don't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, OK, so except for Debian, they're all DVDs. They're in the back. They're free for the taking there. So you, if you have a, an interest in trying out a distribution but have not had the time or uh, whatever to uh, download one, just grab one of them there for you. Please uh, take a look at them. They're in the back. Uh, does anyone here have any announcements about upcoming events or anything else that they would like to um, say at this point? Why don't you come on up? We're having an unconference for Drupal, uh, DrupalCamp.nyc, February 27th at John Jay. It's only $20, and hopefully a lot of people will come. All right. Does anyone else have any events they'd like to announce? All right. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be trivia questions um, asked by Josh um, with material from the presentation. We have three ebook vouchers and three physical books. Uh, so um, please pay attention. And if you want to participate in that, we'll go over the rules on that at the end. Uh, Josh will be asking those questions. And uh, it's usually a lot of fun. Uh, so please welcome Josh Oz with Let's Encrypt, a free automated and open CA. Hi, welcome. I'm Josh Ose. I'm a co-founder and executive director of Internet Security Research Group. That's the organization behind Let's Encrypt. I'm excited to talk about Let's Encrypt today. Um, I think it's a great project. I'm really happy to be involved. So I could get a lot deeper into a lot of the slides I'm going to go through today. So if you have any questions, remember them. Ask them at the end. We'll jump right in. So most people here probably know what HTTPS is, but I think it's worth making sure everyone does, because if you don't know this, this is going to be a very confusing talk. Um, HTTPS is just HTTP over a secure TLS connection. It's how websites communicate securely. And there's really two components to a secure connection using TLS. One is encryption, and that just means essentially agreeing on a code and scrambling bits on the wire. 
The other component is authentication, and that's making sure you're talking to who you think that you're talking to. And these two components of a secure connection are tied together on the web. Right now, you can't have one without the other. For the most part, that's a good thing. So encryption is easy-ish. It's a software stack on your computer. just needs to be installed and configured. Sometimes the configuration can be a little tricky, but for the most part, it's pretty easy. Most web servers directly support it. Authentication is the hard part on the web. Authentication involves a third party, a certificate authority. And the certificate authority will give you a certificate. It's called an X509 cert. And you need one of these certificates to set up a TLS or an SSL connection. TLS is just the latest version of SSL, basically. I'm usually going to call it TLS. SSL is a more popular term. but So you need to communicate with a third party. And this is where things typically get kind of clunky. And it's what discourages people from turning on TLS and securing their websites. Right now, the web is not secure. Only 40% of Firefox page loads use HTTPS. 64% of Firefox HTTP transactions are over HTTPS. I have this data from Firefox because their data about this is open on Firefox telemetry. Um, about 62% of emails received by Gmail are over start TLS, which is email, email over a TLS connection, basically. And I don't have numbers for routers and home gateways, but I'm guessing that the numbers are not good. Um, we really want all these numbers to be 100%. That's what a secure web looks like. So why is 100% important? Two ways of looking at this, one from a user perspective and a developer's perspective. Users are, are just not in control of their data on the web anymore. There's a lot of state in the browser. When you visit a website, there's a lot happening. There's just too much for you to understand what exactly is happening when you visit a website. There's the website content itself and all of its scripts. There's any partners or related content. There's ad networks. There's analytics networks. There's social networks. There's a lot of data about you and your habits flying all over the place. It's just not practical to decide what's, what needs protection and what doesn't. The only reasonable thing to do is to assume that all of it needs to be protected, that treat it all as if it's sensitive data. And it's not just the amount of data that's being sent out. People have gotten much better at piecing together seemingly unimportant pieces of information into a picture that you might want, not want them to have. So protecting a lot of seemingly unimportant data is also important in addition to making sure you're protecting the stuff that is important. So developers also want to protect data. But they also really want integrity. They want to make sure that the website that they've published is the website that people are seeing. So unencrypted traffic can be modified. A common example of this is inserting ad content. Um, Another example, which is a bit more malicious, is script injection. So people can in inject script into insecure websites and use them to attack other websites. So a major source of unencrypted HTTP traffic can be weaponized and used against other parts of the web. And we saw an example of that commonly labeled the great canon recently. So I think getting the, getting the web to 100% is going to be one of the most important things to happen to the web in a long time. It's been a while since something this fundamental happened on the network level. You know, we talked about IPv6 adoption for, what, decades now? And it's slow going. But I think it's really important that we get to 100% HTTPS as fast as possible. We just can't afford an IPv6 timeline for this. So why isn't the web secure? Back to this question. And it comes back to CAs again. It's just too hard. So my friend Colin here, very smart guy, fellow at Cisco, 
It's a hard time getting a cert. <laughs> I can't tell you how many systems administrators I've talked to, and they say, you know, I get certs all the time, a few times a year. I forget how to do it every time. It takes me hours to get it all set up, you know, make sure the credit cards are up to date, make sure everything's configured, remember all my passwords, time my accounts, things like that. It's just too difficult. So here's some of the fun you can look forward to when you're getting a cert from a traditional CA. First, you gotta figure out that you need a cert. That might seem somewhat obvious to some people in this room, but it's not obvious to everyone. Some people think you just flip a switch to turn on HTTPS, and that's the way it should be, but that's not the way it has been. So you gotta figure out you need a cert, you gotta figure out where to get a cert. If you've ever Googled about trying to get a certificate, you get a lot of marketing language from a lot of different companies. Really hard to tell which CA is actually gonna serve your needs best. You gotta figure out how to request a cert. Um, again, you would think that would be easy. You would think it would be a matter of just telling them what domains you wanna cert for, but no. Um, this is one of the most completely insane steps for most CAs is they want you to submit something called a CSR which is really complicated and it's just nuts that they expect you to even know what they are, let alone make them and request a cert with them. Once you do that, you're gonna to have to go through a painful manual verification process in most cases. Um, you might have to set up an email address to prove that you can set up an email address. Some cases you gotta deal with a phone call or submit documentation, things like that. It can take a while. The next step in a lot of cases is you gotta pay. So, if you're, so some people can't afford a cert, most people can, but the key part about this is if you're a sysadmin and you wanna sit down, you're setting up your company's website and you, you wanna make it secure, in most cases you can't just sit down and do that even if you can deal with the CA. You gotta go find someone controlling a credit card and you gotta get billing to let you make this transaction. And then you gotta keep that credit card up to date because the credit card expires, you can't renew your cert, and then you get downtime because of the billing interaction. Um, you gotta figure out how to install your cert, remember to renew it on time. It's, it's not fun. Um, so in the summer of 2012, I was living in Brooklyn actually. I don't live here anymore, but I used to. And I was, at some meetings with my coworker, Eric Rascorla. And the meetings were frustrating. It was about why the web isn't secure. And we just weren't hearing any good solutions. Um, everything was just little incremental up updates that were not gonna make the web 100% secure anytime soon. So we started talking um, and talked through all the different options. And you know, one, one possibility would be to throw out the CA system and do something else. You know, Decide the baby's gotta go with the bathwater, come up with a new scheme and get everyone to adopt that. That's gonna be really time consuming. It's gonna be hard to get everyone to agree. Not gonna happen on any, any kind of time scale that we're looking for. So that wasn't gonna work. So then we talked about improving the CA system. So we could come up with some schemes or recommendations for CAs and beg them to do what we need them to do. And we really didn't think that that was gonna work either. I mean, even if we did succeed in convincing a CA or two to do what we thought was necessary, then we're at the mercy of the CA, right? Like they could just stop doing that at some point and then we'd be back to square one. So somewhat begrudgingly, we came to our solution. We didn't really want a CA, weren't totally sure how to make one, but it seemed like a lot of work. But nothing else was gonna get us where we wanted to be fast enough. Um, yeah. So that, when we came to that solution, the next three years of my life changed quite a bit. <laughs> so what is, what would a new CA look like? Like, if we're gonna build a new CA, it's gotta be different in some really meaningful ways, ways that are, that are gonna get us to a totally secure web. And the number one thing is we need automation. As much as possible has to be automated. 
We really want to get to the point where it's just a switch. You just say, I want a secure website, and that's it. The other thing about the CA is it needs to be free. And it needs to be free again. It's in part about price, right? But mostly it's about automation. If you've got to go find a credit card and go through a billing interaction, then you're not fully automated. Um, that part has to go. Even if we charged a penny for certs, it would, it would ruin the automation and just make it too hard. So the third, the third sort of cornerstone here is openness. And there's two parts to openness. So one is transparency. If we're going to build a CA, we're going to ask people to trust us. And if we're going to ask you to trust us, we've got to give you reasons to trust us. So we need to be transparent. We need to let people know about our policies and practices. We want to use as much open source software as possible so that people can see the software that's actually running in the CA. Um, we want to publish as much as we can about our policies, revocation, things like that. Um, we want to go through audits. All CAs have to go through some audits. Um, it, we also want to be open about uh, incidents, right? Everybody makes mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. We have made them. We will make more. We want to be open and honest about that. The second part of openness is cooperation. And this is a little trickier for me to explain why it's so important, but hopefully I can do it here. If you have a single entity running this organization, their whims can change, right? They can decide other things are important. They can do what they want to do. No one else has real power within the organization to affect change or keep things on the right track. So we wanted a cooperative organization. So it's not you know, some big company's CA, right? It's not, for example, a Mozilla CA. It's not, not an EFF CA. It's its own entity, and it has a number of people on the board controlling the organization from a bunch of different organizations and stakeholders. And we think that kind of co cooperation is really essential for trust. So we started building a foundation for the CA. And we started doing this in late 2012. Um, and nobody really knew about the project for a couple of years because we had some things to do first. So we set, up, we set up a legal entity. That's Internet Security Research Group. We went out and found some initial sponsors. We needed money to do things. Setting up a CA is uh, not trivially cheap. Um, and we need to make a plan for getting trusted. So making a plan for getting trusted is really important. The way trust works is your browser has access to a list of trusted routes. And when you get a certificate from the web, you make sure that it chains back to a route that your browser trusts. So we need to connect our certificates to a trusted chain. If we attempted to put our own route in browsers and wait for that to propagate widely enough, so it's got to get into the browsers and go through software updates all over the world, the cell phones, browsers, operating systems, we estimated that would be a minimum of five years before you could, you could viably use Let's Encrypt certificates on the web, before there was enough coverage. So we needed to, get an, we needed to make a deal with an existing CA, essentially get them to vouch for us. So we entered into a cross-signing agreement with a company called Identrust, who is a, a CA who's got a pretty widely propagated route. And they essentially vouch for us. So when you get a, a Let's Encrypt certificate, it chains back to an Identrust route. And that lets us offer publicly trusted certificates right from the beginning. Um, no waiting period. So it took us a while to set up the initial backers and the, and the entity and the CA partnership. But we ended up with great initial backers, Akamai, Mozilla, Cisco, EFF, um, and a great CA partner, Identrust. And back when I was setting this stuff up, this project was pie in the sky. It wasn't real. It was just another idea for fixing the CA system, of which there are plenty out there. Um, these people took big risks. You know, They wrote big checks, invested big resources. They took big risks on, on this idea, so I'm really thankful to these, these initial sponsors and our CA partner for believing in us. 
So like I said, ISRG, Internet Security Research Group, is the entity behind Let's Encrypt, founded in May 2013. Um, received IRS 501c3 status in June of 2014. And the mission of this organization is to reduce financial, technological, and educational barriers to secure communication over the internet. So this mission is a little broader than just running a CA, running Let's Encrypt. Um, Let's Encrypt is our first major effort towards fulfilling this mission. There may be others in the future. Right now, we've got our hands full getting Let's Encrypt up and running. So once we were done with all this foundation work, we announced the project to the public in November of 2014. And then work on building the CA started in earnest. And this was quite a crazy year. There was a huge amount of policy that needs to be written. We wrote all of our software from scratch. Most CAs use a Java CA package. I forget the name of it right now, but um, we needed our own software in order to implement our protocols and things like that. So we wrote our software from scratch on GitHub in the open, ordered and installed a bunch of hardware, set up the environment, hired a team, spent a lot of time making things as secure as possible. Um, there's a lot of compliance obligations, going through audits, web trust audits, security audits, and getting some more money, getting more sponsors. So here I'm just going to talk for a second about our operations setup that we did during this time, which is powering Let's Encrypt today. We've got about 38 rack units of hardware in two different secure sites. Um, the secure sites are very secure. It's secure rooms inside of other secure rooms inside of other secure rooms, um, dual control, biometrics. It's very hard to get to our hardware. Um, the hardware consists of HSMs, which are hardware security modules. They protect private keys and perform signing operations on them. So because of HSMs, for example, we don't actually know what our private keys are for Let's Encrypt. We have no way to get them. We just request that the HSMs perform operations on them. It's an interesting bit of hardware worth looking up sometime. So there's compute, storage, switches, firewalls, lots of uh, physical and logical redundancy. On the software side, Linux is our primary operating system. We make really heavy use of configuration management. So this system needs to be secure. It needs to be one of the most secure systems in the world. We're incredibly careful about it. And config management is really important to us. Making manual changes to our environment or tweaking things manually one-off is dangerous. It is a recipe for making mistakes. So our config management is set up that, so that we can roll out an entire CA environment exactly the way it's supposed to be in a matter of minutes um, if we need to. And we really work hard to make sure that nothing happens outside of that config management. The third part here is that our API and our OCSP go through Akamai. So we need to be able to stand up to, to DOS attacks, things like that. Akamai offers us pretty powerful traffic management capabilities, makes us feel a little more confident about capacity. Um, there's only one part of our system that doesn't go through Akamai, and that's the actual verification stage of our issuance. That comes directly from our data centers for various reasons. So now we're going to get into more details about how Let's Encrypt works. So these are the three main pieces of the system. We have a protocol called ACME, and it's sort of like DHCP for certificates, automated provisioning of certificates. Then we have a piece of software called Boulder, and you'll notice a uh, cartoonish theme to our names here. Um, we have a piece of software called Boulder that implements the ACME server side, and that runs on our Let's Encrypt infrastructure. <laughs> It's up on GitHub for anyone to see. And then we've got clients. So Let's Encrypt has a client, but there's a lot of clients out there besides the Let's Encrypt client. And the clients speak Acme and talk to our server. But in theory, they could speak Acme and talk to another CA someday that's also using Acme. In order to go further, I'm going to have to explain a little bit about types of certificates. There's three basic types of certificates out there. There's domain validation, 
in domain validation certificates or DV certs, assert control over a domain. So when you apply for a DV cert, what you need to prove is that you can control a domain. That's it. For OV certs, which are sort of the next step up, there is some basic organizational vetting that happens. In particular, CAs will work to confirm the name of your entity, which is associated with a domain. In browsers, browsers don't really trust OV certs that much. They don't put much, much stock in the validation, so DV and OV often appear the same in browsers. Um, the third type is extended validation. And this is where you see, in addition to a lock, a full name and a bigger green bar in browsers. In an extended validation cert, asserts control of a domain, but also much more thorough organizational vetting. These tend to be the most expensive certs because it requires a lot of manual review on the CA side. Um, but DV certs are the only type that we can fully automate. We can automate testing control of a domain, but we can't automate the rest of this stuff. So let's encrypt just issues DV certs, and that's really all you need to set up a secure website. Like I said before, Acme protocol, really at the heart of everything that we do. I talked a little bit about how you can request a certificate via Acme, but there's other management capabilities in Acme. So there's revocation, for example. One cool thing about revocation in Acme and Let's Encrypt that I really love is if someone's private key ever leaks, you can take their private key and revoke their certs yourself. So you can contact us through a client, through Acme, tell us that you have someone's private key and if you can prove it, we'll revoke their certs. So if lists of private keys are ever made public, people can just get us to revoke them, requires no manual intervention, will happen in seconds. Um, I was pretty happy that that made it in there. So Acme is being standardized in the IETF. Um, openness, cooperation, we want to use a standard protocol. It's also not a good idea to come up with cryptographic protocols that don't have wide community review. So we put it in the ITF. It's got a lot of good eyeballs on it. Um, we also want to let other CAs give input on the protocol. We would love to not be the we would love to not be the only Acme users out there down the road. We want other CAs to adopt this. Other CAs do have automated issuance protocols. If, you're, if you have a customer agreement in most cases, you can get access to a protocol for a CA. Um, it's typically proprietary to the CA. We'd like to see that stuff come out into the open with Acme. <clears throat> so this is just a diagram showing a bit about how Acme works. So the client on the left side submits a request to the Acme server server sends back a list of challenges that the, that the client needs to complete. When the client has set up its answer to the challenges, it tells the server that it's ready to get validated. The server reaches back, checks to make sure that the challenges have been completed. If they've been completed correctly, the server will send a certificate back. If not, it'll send a denial and say you have not properly demonstrated control over the domains. There's three challenge types right now. There were two yesterday, there are three as of today. So the first type, which is what most people use, is HTTP. And basically this means prove that you can put a file on your web server. Acme will negotiate a path with you, give you a file, you need to place the file, tell Acme when you're done, and we'll go make sure that you put that file there. The second type of challenge is DVS and I. And this is really about proving that you can provision a virtual host at your domain's IP address. This is most useful for environments that have a lot of certificates on DVSNI um, or using SNI. Um, it scales a little better than HTTP. This morning we enabled something called the DNS challenge. And this is where you don't set up anything on your server itself or in your server config or SNI. You take more or less the file that you would have used in HTTP and you put it in a DNS record and you demonstrate control that way. <clears throat> if you can control DNS, you can control the server, right? <clears throat> so 
So there's sort of three categories of clients out there. First category is what I would call simple clients. You tell it you want to cert, usually a command line, tell you want to cert. <coughs> Excuse me. Been talking a lot today. <coughs> so a simple client will get a cert for you and drop it in directory, and then you figure out what you want to do with a cert. It automates getting a cert, but it doesn't automate the deployment of TLS totally. So there's another category of client which I would call a full featured client. That'll get the cert and configure your server for you. <clears throat> this is what the current Let's Encrypt client is. It's a full featured client. And it's a full featured client because <clears throat> we really wanted to follow all the way through with automation, getting the cert, but also installing it correctly in Apache or Nginx or whatever, and having you up and running. The third category of client is where we really want to be, though. The third category of client is a client built into a web server, so there's no external client at all. We would love to never have to have people use clients. Um, <clears throat> there are not very many servers with Acme support built in yet, but we'd love to see it in Apache and Nginx, and we're gonna be doing some work to try to get it in there. So when you're using Apache or Nginx in particular, when you configure it to set up a secure website, it will just get a cert install it for you and manage it for you. And ideally, you won't even need to know that you have certs or that Apache is getting certs for you. So three is really the best client experience. So there is a server out there that does this. It's called Caddy, made by a guy named Matt Holt. He was an early adopter. Um, and Caddy is, is impressive. So this is what we want setting up a secure website to look like from start to finish. So he's going to edit his config file here and say that he wants to set up the domain mat.life. He's going to start the server. Now it's negotiating Acme and getting a cert. Done. Enables HTTPS. So I got the website. Got a lock. It's secured. And it's got a cert from Let's Encrypt. This This is the only way we're going to get to full, a fully secure web. This is how it's got to work. Um, and we're not going to stop till we get there. So if you have a nice automation like this, you've got some cool things you can do. So right now, we have a 90-day lifetime for our certificates. I think it's scary to some people who are used to a year's lifetime because they're worried they're not going to remember to renew. But the idea here is you don't need to remember to renew. You need to use Let's Encrypt in, a, in an automated system where renewal is automated one way or another. So 90 days is in part to encourage automation, but also long enough that those who can't early on adopt automated renewal, you know, it is possible to renew your cert manually every 90 days if necessary. But we really want automated renewal but the, but the reason short lifetimes are so important is that it, limited, it limits damage from key compromise or misissuance. So if your key is compromised right now, revocation does not work very well on the web. If a, if a certificate gets revoked, browsers have different behaviors for realizing that a certificate is revoked. Chrome uses something called a CRL, which is a list of revocations that Chrome knows about. Chrome decides what revocations get on there. You know, your personal website, if your cert gets revoked, probably not going to make it into the Chrome CRL. So if your personal website certificate gets revoked, it's just going to be valid in Chrome until it expires. And if you have an expiration a year out, it's valid for a year. So we want short lifetime to protect you from that. You know, Firefox. And some other browsers do OCSP checking, which is online certificate status protocol. So they'll, they'll ask us, they'll ask Let's Encrypt if the certificate is valid periodically. Um, and that's a little better because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't discriminate against lesser websites out there. 
But even OCSP has issues. If Firefox, for example, doesn't get an OCSP response at all, so not a positive or a negative, but for some reason it just doesn't get a response, it just assumes that the response is good. So revocation really doesn't work that well. And that, make, that makes a long cert lifetimes dangerous. So it's, it's 90 days now. When we are more confident about the automation and renewal story, we may bring it down. Um, we're gonna be very careful about this. It's not gonna happen soon. But someday you may see 45 days, 10 days, five days, one day. If you get down low enough, you don't even need revocation anymore because a cert will expire before a revocation would even propagate. So revocation would just be not issuing a new cert, right? You just let it run out. That's commonly referred to as short-lived certs. We're not making any sort of commitment to go there, but we're interested in it. Um, it would be an interesting place to go. It would certainly solve a big, a big problem with web PKI. So we started issuing certs on September 14th. That was a stressful day for all of us at Let's Encrypt. Um, we issued a, f a few certs in a very private beta program at that point. Until October 19th, we got our cross signature for IdenTrust. They wanted to make sure that we could issue some certs without messing it up, so they waited a little while to give us the cross signature. We got it, and then we had a limited beta for a while where you could apply to get a certificate from us, and we would send out invites weekly. On December 3rd, we were feeling pretty good about everything, so we switched into public beta, no invite necessary anymore. And by December 9th, in the first six days, we'd issued 100,000 certificates. As of a couple days ago, we've issued 335,000 certificates. Um, there are many different ways to calculate whether 335,000 certificates is a lot of certs or not. But by a number of methods, you know, between our first cert on October 19th and January 19th, we're now maybe the fifth or sixth largest CA by outstanding certificates. Um, within the next few months, we expect to go over a million. Um, by the end of the year, multiple millions of certificates. So you can see the certificates that we've issued by looking at CT logs, or certificate transparency logs. So a great interface for looking these things up. Well. Great, by some definition. The best of what's out there, I would say. CRT.sh, a very useful tool. Um, you can select the CAs you want to look at, and it'll give you a list of their certs. So we've made a commitment every time we issue a certificate, every single time, no exceptions, our systems submit that certificate to CT. And you can look at it. So you can see every single cert. Not every CA does this. Um, a lot of CAs don't. I think doing this is really important in the future. CA's gotta be transparent. You've gotta know what they're issuing if you're gonna trust them. So our commitment to transparency goes beyond submitting certs to CT. Some of this stuff I already mentioned. Our software is totally open source. CAs are notoriously closed organizations and probably the thought of putting their software at the core of their, of their CA up on GitHub would uh, cause some heart attacks. Probably rightfully so in some cases. <laughs> We're committed to uh, quick and complete incident disclosure. A couple weeks ago I was curious about how quick and complete incident disclosure actually is on the web. So I went digging around to see who disclosed incidents, either misissuance or compliance incidents, in 2015. I found four reports from about 1,600 issuing publicly trusted CAs. I do not believe that there were only four instances of misissuance and non-compliance among all the CAs in 2015. It's just not true. People are not disclosing their incidents. Um, we're gonna disclose them, and we're gonna do it fast. We, we disclosed, so one of those four instances from 2015 
was from Let's Encrypt. We had a bug in our software. And we were notified. We fixed it. And we had an incident disclosure out in less than 24 hours. Even when CAs do disclose an instance, they, they typically take weeks to do it. Um, you know, we feel pretty good about our systems, but we're going to make mistakes. They're definitely going to happen. And we need to be prepared to respond and, and be prepared to explain what happened. If in 2016 or any other year in the future that means we take the lead in incident disclosures, we're going to wear that like a badge of honor, right? We need to be honest about what's going on, and every CA does. And so I hope that in 2016, there are fewer incidents overall, but more disclosed. Um, and maybe when, CI, when CAs like Let's Encrypt are more honest about incidents, it will provide cover for others to be more honest. I do think there's a lot of fear out there. You know, there's so few disclosures that CAs don't want to be one of the few that get disclosed, and it becomes a big media story. We should have regular disclosures. <laughs> Software is fallible. Um, also, like I said before, working on making internal policies public. So this is going to take some time for us. Some of our stuff is public. Some of it, you know, we set up a CA in more or less a year. So some of it is going to take some time for us to review and, and get out there. But we're going to work on that. The next up is one of my favorite things about Let's Encrypt. There are places in the world where if you want a secure website, you can't have it even if you know how to interact with a CA or if you have the money. We worked hard with our legal team to make this possible. We'll issue to any TLD or CCTLD except for .mil in the world. No exceptions except for .mil. Um, <laughs> Dot .mil is actually on there because it's a requirement for my dent trust. Um, nobody seems that upset about it. Um, so there's this group of countries called the OFAC 5, and most CAs will not issue to them, in, and a bunch of other countries beside this. We will, we have, and we will. Um, the only thing we won't do is we cannot issue to entities on the US government's SDN list. So government entities of these countries, in many cases, um, certain individuals and, and groups that have been identified with the government as being under sanctions, essentially. So we'll revoke those if we see them. Um, so yeah, this stuff has got to be worldwide. And we're going to provide that service, which is not easy legally, but we can do it. So phishing and malware is another thing we get a lot of questions about. We do not like phishing and malware sites any more than anyone else does. They're an unfortunate blight on the web. But it's really problematic to try to police them at the CA level for a number of reasons. First reason is we just do not have the data. We cannot effectively identify which sites are phishing or malware sites. Um, Almost nobody does. Most CAs try to do this. The record is sketchy at best. Um, there are a couple organizations out there that do have the data, you know, namely Google and Microsoft. They both have APIs, Google Safe Browsing and Microsoft Smart Screen. And they do a pretty good job of protecting you from phishing and malware. So one sort of compromise that we've made is we do check Google Safe Browsing before issuing a certificate. If Google Safe Browsing tells us that a domain is possibly hosting phishing or malware content, we won't issue a cert. But once the cert is issued, we don't do anything else. We don't, we don't revoke for phishing and malware sites. And part of the reason for that is that we can't respond fast enough, right? Even if we did try to figure out exactly what's phishing and what's not and manually respond and investigate to all these reports for the entire web, we can't respond fast enough. You know, our revocations aren't going to propagate to Chrome, for example, with a CRL, unless it's a really important site, you know, like some Alexa Top 500 starts serving up malware. Chrome's not going to find out about it even if we revoke. It won't make any difference. The way you need to protect yourself, if you want to protect yourself from this stuff, is to use phishing and malware protection in browsers. 
That is the best way to protect people. They've got the data, the delivery mechanism, the UI. The third reason that we don't want to be efficient in malware police, if HTTPS becomes existential on the web at a certain point, right? So let's say browsers don't trust non-HTTPS websites, which would kind of be a good place to be. Then if you don't have a certificate, then you can't be on the web at all. Then we are in a position where denying a certificate to someone is existential for their website. And that can be viewed as censorship if the wrong decisions are made, right? We want HTTPS to be existential, but we don't want to be in a position of where we as Let's Encrypt decide who can be on the web and who can't be on the web. So we have a blog post, I think we wrote it in October on our website, explains a little bit more about this. I encourage you to read it if you're interested. Where are we gonna go from here? Our goal is to get to 100% TLS usage on the web. There's, there's sort of two components within that. There's the long tail, right? So one-off websites, smaller websites, system administrators, people running their own box, things like that. Most of what we've issued, so, issued to so far is essentially the long tail of the web. And those people are typically underserved, so it's really important to serve them. And they do make up a significant portion of the web. But we really need big hosting providers, CDNs, things like that to start deploying TLS by default for all of their customers. And we're gonna be focused on doing a lot of that in 2016. We're already in talks with almost every single major hosting provider you can think of, CDNs. We've talked to all of them. We're working on getting them to, to switch over to HTTPS. Either using Let's Encrypt or another CA. I mean, as long as they go to TLS, we're not that concerned with whether they use Let's Encrypt or not. We just, we're providing an option, right? Just costs us money, essentially, when people use us. They wanna get certs from somewhere else? Great, just get a cert. Um, so this is a, the, bottom, the bottom line here. It's sort of tough to estimate what we're gonna do in, in 2016. Depends on how many of these major hosting providers move to Let's Encrypt in 2016, but sort of expected to issue about four to eight million certificates in 2015, which this is hard to measure, but I believe, I believe there's like four or five million certs out there in the web right now. So this would be more certificates than is on the entire web right now, if that number is true, which I'm really not sure if it is, but I think it is. So I wanna thank our, our major sponsors here, Mozilla, Akamai, Cisco, EFF, OVH, Chrome, Identrust, Facebook, Internet Society. Incredibly grateful to these people for making this happen. Um, we've also got a bunch of silver sponsors. It has been, <coughs> I, I deal with most of our sponsors and talking to people about signing up. And you know, it's great, it's great to have major supporters, but some of the, the conversations that I love the most are with our silver sponsors. Small companies, you know, 10,000 bucks is a lot of money for them. They never donated that. They never considered donating $10,000. But uh, they feel really strongly about, our, about what we're doing here. And it's really touching to see them decide that they're gonna buy in. Um, if you wanna help us out, the best way you can help us out is to champion Let's Encrypt at your work. So first of all, make sure you're, that your employer is deploying HTTPS by default for every site you're responsible for. Second of all, try to get your employer to sponsor us. You can always use more sponsors, and sponsorships happen when an individual in the company takes the lead and drives it home. Um, other ways you can help, write or improve a client, answer questions on our community support site. So this point number two is really important. We have community.letsencrypt.org. We do not have the staff or resources to provide technical support to the entire internet. Not gonna happen. 
tech support is really dependent on the community, dependent on people learning how to use our systems, learning about them, and helping other people. You can go out and help and encourage people to install certs, right? See someone without an HTTPS website, encourage them to switch. If they have an issue with certs, point them to Let's Encrypt, explain how easy it is to fix it. Fourth one is a little harder to do, but uh, you can participate in specifying ACME in the ITF. This is the end of my talk here. Um, thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks, and as you can see, we already have people lining up. Uh, please, if you have questions or you want to say something, please come on up to the microphones. We'll alternate back and forth. And for as long as uh, Josh is available uh, and making himself available, uh, your questions will be answered. <coughs> um, why don't you start? Yep. Yeah. Oh, we need the mic on over there. Uh, hi. So um, clearly, issuing free and uh, unlimited DV certs is um, existentially threatening to the CA business model. Um, number one, how did you convince Identrust to do that for you, other than the fact that maybe they had to or someone else would? And number two, where do you see the commercial CA business going when they only have EV certs left? Yeah. I don't think it's clear at all that Lots Encrypt is an existential threat to the CA business. Um, obviously, it's raised some concern with some CAs. You know, there have been a few CAs attacking us in a way that you know, you can see they're sort of uncomfortable with it, but I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of CAs, and most of them get it, to be honest. I don't think they see this as sort of a threat popping up. They see this as an inevitability. This is the way the web works. The web is not gonna continue to depend on the CA system as it was. Something like this is gonna happen. If this didn't happen, something would happen to move us away from CA system as a whole. So in a way, in fixing the CA system is better for CAs than forcing us onto a completely different track. So a lot of CAs don't issue DV certs at all. Um, and there really, there really is a lot of opportunity for value add for, for CAs, you know. EV certs assert different things than DV certs do. There is value to them. Um, that, it requires a lot of work to issue an EV cert it requires you gotta hire a bunch of people, go through a bunch of processes, keep track of a lot of paperwork. We don't do that, they do. It's a, it's a service worth paying for in many cases. Um, you know, we don't issue wild cards. In part, we don't really think they're necessary, but some people do. Um, I mean, they were necessary for a long time. They're not as necessary with Let's Encrypt, but maybe you don't wanna use Let's Encrypt for some reason or maybe you have infrastructure that depends on a wild card. We don't issue them. I really don't think that the DV market is existentially threatening to CAs. I think it's gonna be less impactful than most people feared. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, just one other quick one. Do you do, you do SAN certs at all? Yes, I, uh, we allow up to 100 SANs per cert. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the policy of using the uh, Google Safe Browsing API as a blacklist for denying, uh, denying service because um, I, I'm very concerned about that because I personally have experienced being denied access to a certificate authority because of being on the, the Safe Browsing list uh, incorrectly. And it, it's like a matter of hours and then it goes away and then it's a matter of hours like a few months later. And I think that problem is probably cleared up. I, I haven't seen it happen with my domain in a long time, but I, I'm concerned about how the safe browsing list is maintained and the fact that I don't seem to have any kind of appeal. So are, do, do you have your, number one, do you have your own appeal process inside of Let's Encrypt to say, no, this is a bad entry and, I'm, and you need to do something for me? Um, and number two, do, is there any hope of that policy going away? That, like, like you said, it, it's, it could turn into censorship, and it's not something that you can efficiently handle anyway. Um, so is that ever going to go away, and do you have an appeal process? So we don't have an appeal process for it. It's not really scalable for us. Um, it's really the most efficient to try to get your site off the GSP list. They do have some kind of appeal process. I forget the detail and I don't know how well it works. But 
I agree. It, it is a flawed system, right? Mistakes can happen. Honestly, we would rather not be doing it. Um, we don't think it really makes sense. It's a bit of a compromise. People, I, I think there are people who are uncomfortable in the CA who just comes out and outright says, we're not gonna deal with phishing and malware at all, right? We've made a compromise here. We are gonna check GSP for a while. We don't wanna keep doing it. Um, once we're confident that, um, you know, Mindshare is in the right place and that people are comfortable, we'd like to get rid of it. So at some point in the future, you may arbitrarily decide, not based on some particular indicator you see in the market, but you just might arbitrarily decide it's time to take away that policy. Um, I wouldn't call it arbitrary, but yeah, when when we when we're comfortably when we're comfortable, we'll probably get rid of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the challenges that you face while you're setting up the CA. Uh, and I remember you mentioned at the beginning there was uh, basically you need to raise money from sponsors to pay for things. Uh, so what were the major costs? Yeah. Um, the major costs change depending on what phase you're in. So our biggest cost now that everything is set up is staff, right? Salaries. Um, the ongoing costs aren't so bad. Setting things up... Um, you know, in most cases, a cross-signing deal will cost you money, right? That could be expensive. Hardware can be really expensive. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how much our hardware costs, but it's definitely not cheap. I mean, HSMs in particular, they're 30,000 30, bucks a box, and you need at least a few. Um, you know, you need some serious enterprise-grade storage, tape backup, multiple everything, good bandwidth. You know, having housing your stuff in these really secure rooms is not cheap either. It's expensive hosting space per U. Um, we wrote our own software from scratch. Not cheap either. Um, so yeah, hosting, hardware, if you need to sign a cross-signing deal, um, software you need to write. Well, actually another one big is compliance and auditing. I have spent an insane amount of time reading detailed audit and compliance documents and you need to write a lot of policies, um, a lot of checking, the audits themselves, uh, you know, they're not cheap. Security audits are, oddly optional in the CA business. <laughs> you don't, you're not actually required except, except for going through the web trust compliance audits. You're not required to have someone pen trust you really in any meaningful way, which is scary. So we don't, we don't really consider that to be optional. So we spent some money to get a quality auditing firm, team of hackers to come in and try to break our stuff. We've done that twice already now. Um, knock on wood, I'm going to say one of my one of my better moments from the past couple of weeks is when one of these we had some people audit our internal network. So, see how secure it was, and they said it was one of the most secure networks they've ever seen. I was very proud. Um, but yeah, those aren't cheap either. That pretty much covers the costs involved. What was the second part of your question? Uh, that was the only thing. Or I guess anything else, any other big challenges while setting up the CA, but I think you covered it. Um, man, I'm sure I could think of some good stories, but I don't have AI off the top of my head. Key ceremonies, maybe, is a good one. So would, people know what a key ceremony is. You generate your root keys for a CA. You know, they're your core secret, right? Key ceremonies are very complicated. You got to buy hardware, buy it off the shelf, you don't get it shipped, you buy it off the, you walk into a store and buy it so there's no interdiction, you keep it very closely guarded, you set it up, you remove hard drives, remove networking info, you have a script for a ceremony, you generate keys. Um, I didn't know about any of this when I decided to build a CA. That was, that was a challenging time. Um, 
we had to do it a few times over to make sure that we really generated our keys in a secure, defensible way. Um, that was probably one of the bigger challenges for me. Network gear. I'm sure you can't speak to any specific partnerships you have potentially ongoing, but please, dear God, tell me you're working with the SMB network vendors to try and make it so that my parents' Linksys router finally, <laughs> finally will actually have a real certificate. Uh, I can tell you this. One of the places where we're going to be issuing a lot of certs that I didn't expect early on is we have been in contact with some major ISPs with millions and millions of customers. And they're, issued in, they're interested in getting a lot of certs for us to provide them to the network gear in people's homes. So it's happening. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, my question about, uh, first, thank you for, for your talk. And thank you for making the internet more secure. And my question is about providing certificates for IP addresses. We don't do that, and we're not going to do it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't remember all the rationale off the top of my head from those discussions. I have too many meetings, but um, my takeaway is that we don't do it, and we're, we're not going to do it. Any limit on how many certs per domain or per organization? I mean, yeah. So rate limits have been a real challenge for us. We need to prevent abuse and make sure that everyone can get a certificate without using up all of our resources. So we do have some rate limits in place. Certificates per domain is the one that people hit the most. Right now, it's five certificates per domain per week. So what that means is you can issue five certificates for domains under example.com every week. But each cert can have up to 100 SANS. So in theory, you could issue, for example.com, and 499 subdomains in a week by doing five certs with 100 SANS. That makes sense so far? Um, people hit the cert th this limit because they accidentally issue a cert and realize they wanted the cert to have some different domains in it. Um, it's good to test your certificate issuance against our staging server before you go to production. So when you go to production, you get exactly what you want if it's going to be complicated. We would like to relax those limits a bit. We need to be careful. Um, we probably will relax them. We haven't yet. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, sure. the, fir the, fir the first question is, uh, there's an inherent problem with the, the, the CA system where only it takes is a compromise of one host. Let's say one host gets hacked. And then you can start issuing out fraudulent certificates. Uh, By to, host, you mean one CA gets hacked. Yeah, one CA gets hacked. And then right. you can start issuing out fraudulent uh, certificates uh, to, to any domain. Uh, this, this has happened before when, uh, like, I think it was like a, I think it was like a Turkish one. Intermediate you know, gets hacked. Turk and they start giving out yeah. fraudulent for Google. And there's no, there's no way that, uh, that they can be determined uh, which, which one is legitimate. Uh, there's, there's a, there was a, there was an interesting workaround um, by HTTPS everywhere. It's Observium that watches for changes in CA uh, when you have 90-day um, uh, life safe bands. That kind of, kind of kills that strategy. I, I don't know if you're working with them because they, they also want more uh, encrypted web. And the other issue is. Well, can I address okay, that one? Yeah, sure. Otherwise, I'll forget this. I'll, I'll forget. So one thing that, so that is definitely a big problem that any CA can issue for any domain. One of the things that we recommend and that we respect at Let's Encrypt is CAA records. So you can publish a DNS record that says what CAs are allowed to issue for you. And then if the CAA record doesn't, you know, doesn't drive with the cert that you have, it won't be trusted. So Let's Encrypt understands and trusts CAA records. So if you say that only Global Sign can issue for you, then you, nobody will be able to get a cert for you from Let's Encrypt. That is actually where our bug was, by the way. Our disclosure in 2015 was our CAA checking was happening. The check was happening, but we weren't considering it in the result. So we were ignoring CAA rules for a few weeks. That was 
that was the bug in our software, but it's fixed now. And uh, the, the second issue is you, you list, uh, you make a list of all domains which you've issued certificates for, uh, and you don't see this as, uh, I see this as a security bug because now you're giving a whole bit, uh, list of domains, uh, some of which might not have been public. Uh, for, for example, I have a few hosts which have DNS, so I can get to them, but you know, uh, Google has things like a no robots.txt and other workarounds uh, to keep certain hosts hidden. Uh, again, you have a, a sub and subdomains which are not generally brute, uh, which are somewhat resistant to brute force uh, yeah. discovery. We understand the concern um, here. So you just give a whole list of everybody who requested a certificate, meaning they have somewhat valuable services. Uh, a safe and plain view means the person has valuables. Yeah, so we understand the concern here. There's a trade-off to protect that, right? And our view, at least at this point, is that the benefit of being transparent about who we issue to outweighs concern about hiding domains. Um, I do understand the concern, though. It's, it's just an unfortunate trade-off between transparency and you know, the motivations of people who want to hide domains. If you want to hide domains, you should probably use a, a CA that's not using CT. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, first off, great talk, and Let's Encrypt is great, I use them at work. And uh, so my question is, I noticed you guys open source Boulder. I was wondering if there's any concerns around somebody taking that and modifying it so it just okays all the challenges. Uh, there are some pretty tight controls around that. Um, I can't get into all of them, but you know our, our stuff is up on GitHub. It's got some commit protections turned on and a limited number of committers. Almost all commits go through two reviews, two code reviews before they can go make, go in, and you know we check over the commits to make sure it's only what we saw. And then there are more there are more tests that happen between moving from GitHub to a deploy. Um, <clears throat> it's a you know it's in our threat model. Um, is all I can really say, and we. We work pretty hard to make sure that's not happening. Hi there. Uh, so not to detract from the great work you guys are doing, um, this has been really a long time coming, but uh, I assume you're familiar with Dane or DNSSEC-based authentication of yes. named entities. Yeah. And what do you see, I guess, in, in the longer term, uh, what do you see as being the, the, the future role of the public CA? Yes, so the IETF water cooler talk. Um, this is a complicated one, in part because I do not participate in discussions about Dane that much, so I'm no expert on what's going on in that space. And there's also a difference between, you know, if Lutz Encrypt as an or organization has an opinion here in mind, right? Lutz Encrypt as an organization, we don't really take a stance on this. We're just doing what we do, and you know, if things change, we'll take them into account. I personally am I'm not that into DNSSEC. I don't really like it as a solution. I, I find it unnecessary and government-controlled PKI. So personally, I'm not, I'm not a fan of DNSSEC. That does not mean that Let's Encrypt may not, won't engage with it. Um, I believe our DNS resolvers are DNSSEC aware right now. Um, from what I've heard, we may be able to help some stuff with Dane. It's just too early to say how Dane's going to play out, whether it's going to be in a position to replace the CA system or work with the CA system. I'm not really sure. Thanks. Hi. Um, my question is about uh, the CA um, abundance that we have right now. Last time I checked my phone, I have almost 200 CAs from yeah. entities that I, I can't even pronounce. Feel secure? Do you see any problem <laughs> about that? What, what do you think about it? I mean, yeah, it's a problem, right? And the problem really is, it's not inherently the number 200, right? It's a problem of standards. So you don't want to say like there's only one or two CAs out there and put all your eggs in one basket. You want there to be multiple CAs, but you want some protections in there. So the situation is better than it used to be. We have now the CAB forum and baseline requirements and you know root programs are really checking in to make sure that CAs are passing audits. 
I do think there is more work to be done. I do think we need to be a little tougher on CAs. Um, you know, I mentioned at least one thing here, like you know, serious penetration and security test audits are not part of the baseline requirements. They probably should be. Um, there's a lot we can do with the standards here. You know, another thing would be CT participation. CT participation. It's hard to. It's hard, for example, to monitor our audit misissuance if if CAs have thousands of certificates you don't know about, right? Um, we can do better with standards. I think that's the way we're going to have to address it: is to up the standards and make sure that only the best CAs are staying in the mix. Make sense? Makes sense. Um, and one more thing: um, Do you see as a possibility that ISPs will try to um, force feeding us certificates, a CA, a CA certificate, to be able to keep doing caching and stuff like that? I guess it's possible. Um, and we should be vigilant against people doing stuff like that. Do I think it is likely to catch on in a big way? I don't think so, but I don't want to be the guy who, you know, says it's not a threat and then makes it easier for it to happen, right? People try to, there's all sorts of man in the middle attempts out there. That's one variation on it. We should make sure that stuff doesn't happen. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um... So the whole notion of ACME as a standard seems pretty interesting because uh, with respect to, for instance, the other uh, gentleman who asked about being able to keep certs private or the issuance private for internal use, a lot of companies do have internal CAs, some of which are tied to the public, uh, public CAs and some of which are totally internal and private. But it seems like uh, ACME would solve a lot of the problems I've seen inside of larger companies where you try to issue certificates relatively automatically and I'm curious uh, if you've been talking to companies that uh, make that sort of software to tie this protocol in now that you're going through the IETF and how you see that working out and um, how you feel about it. If, I, if Acme is useful to other people, use it. Happy to see it, happy to see it out there. I mean, Acme is going to enable better security wherever it is, and that's usually a good thing. I have not talked to any software vendors in particular about using Acme outside of Let's Encrypt, except for some other public CAs. Um, I imagine that will happen more around the IETF than with Let's Encrypt in particular, since what you're talking about doesn't really involve Let's Encrypt. So I hope it happens. I haven't dealt with it that much, but I think it's pretty early on in Acme's life. Um, we're, the, we're the first only user of it that I know of right now. Um, but it'll get bigger, it'll grow. How do you see uh, Let's Encrypt's relationship with the other root CAs and with browsers evolving? Because right now it seems that you're potentially highly dependent on your cross-signing agreement with Identrust. Uh, and if they walked away, this wonderful thing that you've built is kind of uh, left dangling outside of the whole trust network. Yeah, I, I don't think they're gonna walk away, number one. <laughs> We've made pretty sure they can't walk away. <laughs> um, we have good relationships with a number of CAs. If it happened, we would get another cross sign. Again, some people really perceive this Let's Encrypt project as adversarial with the rest of the CA world, and that's just not what it's like. I mean, I talk to other CAs all the time. Um, this is a good thing for the CA business. It's a good thing for PKI and the web. Um, we have other friends. Are you working towards having your keys distributed with browsers and the, the core bundles that are shipped with Fedora and Ubuntu? Yep, so we've applied to all the major root programs. Um, we're going through the steps necessary to be in them and to start the propagation. So hopefully in about five, six years, we won't be dependent on anyone's cross signature. But we, you know, that process takes a while, um, you know, for good reason. You don't want to just let anybody into these things because they sent you a signed PDF. Um, yeah, we'll get there. Thanks. Hey, Josh. Thanks uh, <clears throat> for speaking to us today. Um, just a quick question on the 90 days yeah. uh, policy. What drove that design? Just curious. Like, why don't you start with something like maybe 45 or even less to begin with? 
Um, so we wanted something short enough to encourage automation, but we also understand that those systems aren't in place right now. Clients aren't mature enough. There's not enough operational experience. So we wanted something short enough to encourage automation, but long enough that if you did need to renew manually, you've only got to do it four or five times a year, which is doable given how easy even the simple clients are. But really it was about acknowledging that the renewal automation isn't quite there yet and we can't go too low with it right now. Hi, great talk. Um, why did you choose not to support .mil domains? Were they, uh, did they have some onerous requirements or something? Contractual obligation with IdentTrust. It's part of the deal. Who? IdentTrust, our cross signature. Oh, I see. Okay. Our cross sign, uh, the root that cross signs us does not, it excludes .mil. So therefore, we can't issue to it either. So it's part of, it's part of our agreement with IdentTrust that we not issue to .mil. Um, so the certificate you issue expires in 90 days. What about the chain cert? How often do you renew that? So the intermediate certs, oof, this is going back to that key ceremony. Um, <laughs> I believe the intermediate certs are five or six years. So the way, the, so the way that we do it is we have a root, a root certificate. And the private key for that, we actually keep it offline. So that's in you know, layers of safes, offline, impossible to get to. Um, but we have signed intermediate signing certificates with that root, and those are online. The offline root has, I think, 20, 20 or 30 year life on it. The intermediate has, I think, five years, five or six or something like that. And then, <clears throat> you know, when it, we can just generate more of those when we need to sign them with our route, get them cross-signed, right. okay. they'll be ready. Um, <clears throat> right now, we just, we have essentially an intermediate and a backup intermediate. And pretty soon, we'll generate our third intermediate, which will be ECDSA. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious. I really haven't heard of Iten Trust before now. Are they new, or have they been around for a while? They've been around for a while. Um, if you look at the name of their actual route, it's Digital Signature Trust, DST. Um, been through a few acquisitions, mostly in the financial sector, over the past 25 years. Um, not not a common end entity. Public CA. I think they do a lot of you know finance sector, government-related work. Um, so not a, not a common end entity sort of where you would get like for your private website or something, but they do have a publicly trusted route. And they are in all the major browsers, all the major versions of those browsers? Yes. Um, the stuff that we've identified where they're not in, they're not in some older versions of Android, like at least going, you know, I don't remember the exact version, but maybe Android 2 doesn't support it which is probably the biggest problem. We've also identified that they're not in some game consoles. Like they're not in, I don't think they're in the Wii game consoles. So there may be some game consoles where the, where the cross sign doesn't work. But coverage is pretty good. And I think, you know, before Let's Encrypt, you didn't see the IdentTrust roots used that much on the web. Now you're gonna see them a lot, so I think That'll provide some motivation for game consoles, for example, to ship updates. But coverage is pretty good. Great, wonderful. Hi. Uh, this project is like a real breath of fresh air for like the internet and what's you know the void has been there. Um, so thanks for that. And you sort of alluded to the fact that like other CAs sort of didn't feel threatened, but kind of welcoming almost to this idea. Um, and that it didn't really hurt like their business model necessarily. So what what would your speculation be as to why none of like the 200 unpronounceable CAs in the world potentially like started to do something like this sooner maybe if they've been you know around for you know some considerable amount of time? It's a good question. Um, like I said, I think this sort of thing is an in inevitability, and I wish it had happened earlier. On the other hand, I'm pretty happy to have been able to be involved in it. It's an exciting project. Um, 
Yeah, somebody should have done this a long time ago. <laughs> I think it's a I think it's a complicated thing to set up, right? Like it's you could make a decision we're just going to set up a bunch of servers and start giving out certificates and get audited, right? But it's more than just that, right? It's it's organizational. You need to have if you're going to give away a whole bunch of stuff for free, you need to have a model in which you can do that, right? Um, you got to have the money to invest in that infrastructure. I don't know, is the real answer to your question. I think innovation is not really a big part of the DNA of the CA ecosystem up till now. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's the bottom line, right? There's not a lot of money in giving away free certs. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Just one last quick question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, anybody, anybody who can help, uh, please support, join the community. Um, and I have a question about that. I um, ran into my first Let's Encrypt certificate in, on my BlackBerry 10 device in December and it didn't work. And yeah. I was like, well, this is weird. I thought that was going to work. Um, and I sorted it out by myself. Uh, it wasn't that hard for somebody who understands all this stuff, but if you don't, it, you're screwed. Um, where would be the best place for me to re register and write that up that has a good, good Google page rank? Do you want to highlight a particular resource? Um, we have a community.letsencrypt.org. Community.letsencrypt.org. Which, okay. which is a, hosted by Discourse, if anyone's familiar with Discourse. Mm -hmm. um, almost everyone that works at Let's Encrypt or on Let's Encrypt reads that on at least a somewhat regular basis. So, you know, there's only so many of us to respond. And, and I'm not yeah. writing up the question, I'm writing up the answer I'm, I'm offering. Yeah. To, yeah, people are gonna look for the solution there on mm -hmm. community.letsencrypt.org. So if you write it up there, people can find it by searching. Okay. That's the best place. Thanks. Yeah, super useful if you, if you run into any issues with Let's Encrypt and you solve them. Write them up on the community website so people know where to find it. Yeah. Hey, Josh. Hey, Rob. Um, great talk, thanks. Um, do you th what do you think, um, I guess for the future of HTTP, what's your prediction for when HTTP will be kind of gone off the internet? Uh, too long in the future, but I think there are gonna be some stages here, right? First, we need to make it reasonable for people to switch off HTTP. That's what Let's Encrypt is about. Um, I think there's gonna come a day when browsers are gonna crack down, right? Like. Browsers have made some moves where it used to be, I mean, still in a lot of cases when you visit a website that's not using encryption, the browser just acts like everything's totally fine, right? Like you don't really, like no issues here, just keep browsing, you know? But that's, that's gonna end someday, right? Um, I think the real end is gonna come when the mainstream browsers finally put their foot down and say, if it's not secure, it's not secure, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna let our users just go there without clicking through some serious UI. Um, we're not ready for that yet. I think it's gonna happen. Um, and that will, that will pretty much be the end of it. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't wanna preempt anyone else's questions. I, it looks like I'm at the end of the line here unless I inspire one or two questions. But I, I, the, sort of the elephant in the room with all of these sorts of discussions are the tinfoil hat theories about what, uh, what sort of, what would it take to corrupt you and the whole project? Um, <laughs> and any good stories about such efforts that uh, that you would like to share, or, or anything like that? I think uh, the fact is you're you're um, trying to make an aspect of um, espionage a lot more difficult. Um, let, never mind the the. the, the sort of casual attempts at interfering with our browsers and our credit cards, but the actual ability to um, tap all communications becomes potentially one degree harder unless you happen to be the CA that everyone is using to secure that traffic, in which case it might become one degree easier uh, yeah. to an extent because it also provides for auth auth uh, authentication of to who is actually doing that. How do you feel about that and um, you know, what's going on there? Well, we've talked about it. Um, do deal with SQL injection tax on an hourly basis that is not working. Um, you know, the success of this project is completely based around people trusting us. 
if you don't trust us, if browsers don't trust us, if the cab form doesn't trust us, this project is done. Um, the best way to end this project is to demonstrate that we can't be trusted. Um, and we work, make, we work really hard to make sure that's not possible. Um, then my apologies for sort of lightly insinuating that you, you, you're, you could be corrupted. I was just yeah. joking. I mean, we could be, right? Any, any organization can be. It's a risk. Um, you know, we encourage people to try to find flaws in our project and report it and help us be secure. You know, we're, we're just people that write software. <laughs> There's bugs. Um, but yeah, probably the best thing someone could do if they really want to discredit us is know, exploit some serious vulnerabilities repeatedly, you know, maybe we don't respond as well as we should. I'm not really sure, except to say that, you know, eroding the trust that people have in us is the best way to, to come after us. And, you know, we're very well aware of that. And we, in everything we do is every decision we make, uh, how are we helping people to trust us? And are we giving them any, any reason not to trust us? Uh, where are, what country are you, I assume you're headquartered in the U.S.? Yeah, we're the uh, Internet Security Research Group is a California corporation. If you are, would you want to consider possibly implementing maybe a warrant canary if you ever get a formal government request for somebody's private keys? Uh, already done. Good. Uh, if you... <clears throat> If you go to our website, we publish what we call a transparency report every six months. Um, they cover a six-month period, so the most recent one went through, I think, June. And we wait until three months after every period to publish a transparency report so that we can resolve any litigation that may have started during the period. So you can look up the transparency reports on our website. We'll be publishing another one in a couple months, and we'll keep doing it. I have a question from a live stream viewer. Um, how does a regular person with a website on a hosting provider set about getting a certificate? How does a, can you repeat the question? A regular person with a website that's on some hosting provider, yep. how do they go about getting a certificate? It depends on what kind of access you have at your hosting provider. If you have full access to the server, you would download our client, look up some instructions and issue some simple commands to get a cert. Depending on what web server you're using, our client might be able to configure your web server for you. Um, if you don't have that kind of access, you're going you're gonna to need your hosting provider to help you out. Um, you know, For example, I, DreamHost announced this week that they are going to make it easy for everyone on DreamHost to use Let's Encrypt certs. Um, more will come soon. Uh, does that answer the question? I guess so. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so you talked a little bit about technical threat models, and I guess part of the questions that Peter was asking was about your organizational threat model, perhaps. Um, and so one of them seems also because, uh, well, it seems like your funding sources are purely donation-driven, and that might, that might be part of what may, you know, ultimately lead to troubles down the way if you're yep. funding your operations like that. Because, you know, a lot of nonprofits sort of make the mistake of thinking that just because you're a nonprofit, you can't make money, which isn't the case. So have you given any thought to that, et cetera? Yeah, I give a lot of thought to it. <laughs> um, what was the result? <laughs> so the interactions, I, we feel pretty confident about corporate sponsorships. I think most of the big players on the web see a lot of value here. Um, I don't think we're going to have trouble continuing with corporate sponsorships. Um, we are also going to look, we're looking at grants and, you know, funding from the public. So, you know, drives where we go for individual donations and things like that. Those are the three main areas of diversification. We've talked about some other funding options, which, you know, it's too speculative for me to get into today, but we think about it a lot. We're feeling pretty good about the uh, sponsorship model. It really allows us the most freedom to do what we want and um, not trade obligations in exchange. So if we can keep up the sponsorship model, it lets us run our services for free. It's really the best thing for us. If we have to look elsewhere, we will. But we're feeling pretty good about where we're at right now. 
Well, I think that we've reached the end of the questions. Thank you very much, Josh. Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. So at this point, we, uh, we have our trivia. Uh, we actually will have to cut down to three questions. Our ebook vouchers are not good at this point. So we have three books, three questions. We can do six questions, but there will only be three books. So first question, if you have those ready. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. All right, so um, yeah, New Year, getting back in the groove here. So the, uh, the rules here are that Josh will ask questions pertaining to, uh, well, really they can be any questions, but they could be pertaining to the presentation. He knows whether the answers are right or wrong. He will be the judge of that. Um, I will be looking for hands up. The first person to get their hand up will be called on. Um, if you have the right answer, you win. If you don't, then the next person with their hand up uh, will be called on if you call out the answer that doesn't get you the prize, but you might be right. Does that? All right, you ready? Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, so don't call out the answers that might make you very upset when you don't get what you want. All right, question number one. Let's Encrypt issues DV certificates. What are the other two types of certificates? I uh, saw so your hand go up first. Um, organizational validation. Got it. By all means, please pick one of these. Man, I want the Go book. <laughs> <laughs> um. I can ask you a question. <laughs> Let's encrypt that our server software is mostly written in Go. Um, next question. The ACME protocol has three types of challenges. One is DVS and I. What are the other two? Um, you, sir, right here. I saw your hand go up first. Uh, Got it. All right. Please select one of the books. All right. Third question, approximately what percentage of Firefox page loads are over HTTPS? Uh, you, sir, in the back. That was transactions, not page loads. Uh, in the white shirt over here? Uh, you, yes. Nope. Oh, we're narrowing down oh, over in the back there? 34%. No, I thought this would be easier. Um, I think your hand was just stuck up right there. Get your hand. You got it. All right. There we go. Thank you, everyone. That's the last of our books. Uh, for the giveaway. Thank you very much, Josh. We will be going to the storehouse, I believe. Storehouse Pub, 23rd and 6th. We have two tables upstairs. Um, if we, uh, so, but I think yeah, I was going to say the downstairs. I think is where we're going to end up because I don't think two tables will be enough. If any number of you want to go and talk, Josh, will you be? Hopefully, you'll be able to join us there. Thanks, um, everybody. Th yeah, and thank you again. Mm -hmm.